Oh well. It's been 11 years since the last Devil May Cry game was released. And yes, it's been 11 years. And now we can finally say that the action series that started the whole genre has finally made its return. Now, if you were in my shoes, you probably wouldn't have felt the same sting that other Devil May Cry fans have felt. Probably because I just started playing the series in mid-2017, at the fourth game in the series. Yeah, that was weird. Rather, I was feeling the sting of waiting for Kingdom Hearts 3, only to be greeted with disappointment with the results, but that's for another time. Before I start with DMC5, I think I should give a short summary of my thoughts on the series before I start with the true sequel to Devil May Cry. Now starting off with the first game in the series, DMC1 was kind of a Resident Evil game that was remixed into an action game, but it was really just an action game with horror elements into it. Now the thing is, I actually finished playing DMC1 recently, and to be fairly honest, yeah, I don't really think it holds up that well to be honest. But even then, DMC1 was one of the most important games ever made because it pretty much started the action genre. God of War and Dark Souls owe their existence to Devil May Cry 1. Now, DMC2 on the other hand, in the same way that DMC1 embodied a 90s cheesy action flick, DMC2 decides to play like an early 2000s cheesy sequel to a movie that was in the 90s, with weapons lacking impact and also, well... I think this says it all. Now Devil May Cry 3 in the other hand is where the series really started to find its ground. The thing is, Hideki Itsuno, the guy who was brought in to fix DMC2, was also the director for DMC3 and it was in that game where he truly gave the franchise its own identity. Dante went from being a cheesy but still funny character to a complete and other badass in DMC3. Of course, DMC3 was incredibly hard to pull off but there were so many mechanics to play off of that it really did allow you to push your skills to the limit in that game. Now, the sequel to DMC3, DMC4 is a very important game within the series because it's also the first time in the series that Dante isn't really the main character, although he's still playable in the game. The big problem with DMC4 is that you have all these intrinsic mechanics, every single thing pushed to the limits, but a combination of mediocre weapons for Dante and a very lacking level design left much to be desired. Now granted, DMC4 is still my favorite in the series, no doubt about that. Special Edition is actually the version that I played and made it my favorite version of the series. But the thing is, yeah, it needs a lot of work before it can truly really be the action game. Now, unfortunately, five years later, we got DMC, the reboot. The reboot, DMC, the base version at least, fell like off DMC4's mechanics stripped away and replaced with forced combat tactics, such as having to use blue weapons for blue enemies, or red weapons for red enemies, which basically restricted your combos, weapons lacking impact, and a very bland story with an unlikable protagonist and really in general a very unlikable cast of characters that lacks any of the charisma or charm that the original characters ever had. Because Dante in this game lacks so much charisma, no one took a liking to his character at all. Of course, they didn't stop journalists from making articles about how people hated Dante in this game because he had no white hair, as if that was the biggest reason why. Please. Even if Dante had white hair in that game, which he does get by the end, he would still be a shitty character. And after that, after that final scene of the reboot, that was pretty much all fans have had at that point. That was the conclusion they got to the franchise. It didn't go out with a bang, but with a whimper. 
and for years fans have pretty much lost hope in a sequel to DMC4 ever really being made. So when Hideki Itsuno at E3 2018 announced DMC5, many fans began to cheer with excitement when the series they sorely missed had finally made its return. He has lost his hand, meaning because Virgil? Yes! Capcom! Capcom, yes! As director, I've waited four years for this. Thank you so much. DMC is back! A year later, DMC5 is released and many fans have voiced their praise for the game and now it's time for me to give my thoughts on it. Before we get into the dead weight, Kylo Ren and everyone's favorite demon slaying mercenary, let's get into the features of the game. The controls are now back to their classic control schemes such as L1 being your devil trigger and R1 being your lock on. You've also got jukebox in the gallery section which you can use to change the game's music but Earth to Capcom, forcing me to pay 10 extra bucks to get to hack and slash demons while listening to, to Devil's Never Cry isn't the most pleasing thing to do to me. There's also Bloody Palace mode that was recently added in a free update in which you can unlock special taunts that can end up putting Dante Harimars out of business for good. What you lack uh, is this. Thought you like it. You've also got Easy, Normal, Hard, Dante Must Die, Heaven or Hell, and Hell in Hell mode back. Although I do wish that Gods Must Die and Must Style mode made it back in, and the lack of a turbo mode is a bit of a letdown for me. Although fingers crossed for that to be in a future patch. There's also a training mode new to the series called The Void where you can practice your combos, and also try different ways to counteract different enemies. A welcome feature to a series all about mastering your timing and your skills. Time for us to get to the thing that sadly ended up being the only thing that defined the current generation, but thankfully it plays its role well here. The graphics. Now DMC5 runs on the RE engine, the same engine Resident Evil 7 and Resident Evil 2 Remake run on. I was personally worried that DMC's over the top balls to the wall style action wouldn't translate that well to this kind of style of graphics. Thankfully I was wrong and this game looks beautiful. Although I kind of would like some more colors to breathe a little bit of life into the game's environment and the character designs. Thankfully, the game's performance doesn't get tanked from the graphics as the game runs on a damn smooth 60fps. Even though I prefer the more anime-ish style of previous games, I will commend Itsuma and his team for not sacrificing performance for the sake of, ooh, pretty graphics. The facial animations for the characters are pretty good, although I do feel that sometimes they can fall into the uncanny valley. Dante's face in particular runs into this a fair bit of times. How's that for Road Rash? Now that we got all that pesky graphics and all that other crap out of the way, let's talk about what we've been waiting for. The juicy. The tasty. The salivating. The pleasuring. The scrub- Alright, let's get on with the gameplay. DMC5 once again brings Nero, aka the dead weight, and Dante, our favorite devil hunter, along with newcomer V. Now, V is a shift in the style of Devil May Cry by requiring a very different style of tactics. Rather than being a loud, rambunctious, wisecracking demon slayer, V is as weak, but not as pathetic, as his Star Wars lookalike Kylo Ren. So as a result, he needs to rely on his demon pets, Griffin, a bird that basically functions as your long range style weapons, Shadow, your melee style weapons, and Nightmare, basically your devil trigger. Nightmare functions on its own by blowing shit up and turning the baddies into mincemeat. Playing as a mastermind, commanding your demon pets, and basically turning the battlefield into an action set piece with you as the director commanding the action is an awesome feeling. However, V has to hang back and let his demon pets do the dirty work so the former can leap into the action and finish off the remaining enemy. Blast. V's pets also have health bars and can get KO'd for a while, so you do have to make sure that you play smart while using them. 
Personally, I feel that while V can be fun, he feels a bit too repetitive for me to use and, and on higher difficulties, some, some of V's problems begin to appear, especially on Dante Must Die mode, where the entire gameplay becomes a complete slodge because of just how repetitive V can be, because V himself doesn't really have that many moves to really spice things up in a fight. However, he is still very fun to play as, and still one of the most interesting parts of the game's mechanics. Now that we got our magician out of the way, let's talk about Nero, aka the dead weight. Returning from DMC4, Nero has once again got his gun, Blue Rose, and his classic sword, Red Queen, the former of the weapons functioning very differently from DMC4. For starters, Nero's gun, Blue Rose, has a different feeling to it than it was like in DMC4. This helps give Nero a more unique kind of gun, which helps differentiate itself from Ebony and Ivory, because let's be honest, in DMC4, Blue Rose didn't really have much to set itself apart aside from its charged shot. Now, Red Queen pretty much functions as it did in DMC4, with Nero being able to charge the sword up by using the L2 button to turn on the flames, and basically turn the battlefield into a flaming display of badassery. But what really plays into Nero's moveset are his new robotic arms. Nero's arms add up some variety that he lacked back in DMC4 and gives a chance to pull off some sick ass combos. Yeah. Overture allows Nero to create an electric shockwave that, depending on the enemy's position, can send them into different directions. Gerbera allows Nero to reflect projectiles and basically gives him his own version of Trickster. Punchline? Whoa, baby. This baby. An arm that allows you to ride a rocket. Anyone getting flashbacks to this? <laughs> Tomboy basically turns Nero into a hacking and slashing madman and has Nero decide to take a page out of Guts' book by turning his gun into what amounts to a torpedo. Now, some enemies just don't get how outclassed they are. With Helter Skelter, it allows you to drill the information into their skulls. <laughs> Ragtime allows you to basically rip off Dante's Quicksilver style and freeze enemies into place and go to town on them. And Rawhide allows you to whip it good and send enemies flying with its whip ability. All these arms have big moves that you can charge up at the cost of your arms, such as turning one of your arms into a mine, to Nero deciding to take a page out of Dragon Ball with a Kamehameha. Now, the biggest problem I have with these arms is that you can't switch them on the fly without destroying them, which makes Nero feel restricted to a certain extent and forces you to waste arms if you want to use a different one. I mean, look at it with mods, it doesn't really seem to be that broken. And before you say that, oh no, then Nero's arms become broken because then you can use break moves one to the other. Well, that doesn't work because Nero can just do exactly that even with normal gameplay. It just feels more restricted this time around. At least in this game, Nero does have enough versatility that he needs to stand on his own in this game.
After 11 years, we can finally get back to wearing the smoking six stylish red coat of Dante. And oh boy, Dante in this game. I don't think I've ever played a character this well designed in any action game. Ever! A quick trip down memory lane with you guys with Dante is that I felt that in DMC4 he had the versatility of styles, but he didn't have a good enough weapon roster to back it up. Gilgamesh felt clunky to use and required exploits in the game for it to truly become an effective weapon, while Lucifer felt too situational to use to really be all that helpful. And Yamato was really just a few one note commands. Really the only new weapon that I felt was truly fun to use was Pandora. In this game, Dante has both the weapons roster and the style switching to truly perfect his gameplay styles. Starting off with Dante's guns, we got the standard good old fashioned to ebony and ivory, but with Gunslinger, you can fire each one off on their own, and oh boy is it awesome. Coyote A is back and... just watch. <sighs> Such beauty. The Kalina Ann makes a return, but this time around, you can get another version of it and combine it to turn the whole place into a set piece album Michael Bay movie. And now we have the Fost Hat. Dear Itsuno, what kind of fucking pot have you been smoking? Yes, folks, Dante's newest firearm is a hat that you can use to expand red orbs and turn them into gallon guns, a suspending shield, and I'm not even kidding, meteors! I guess you could say that was a casualty. Another feature of the hat is that you can throw the hat onto an enemy's head, fortunately you cannot possess them, sorry Nintendo fans, and use them to farm red orbs. The catch is that if you get hit, you're gonna lose a lot of red orbs, making it the perfect risk and reward type of weapon that encourages experimentation to truly master. However, I do feel that Fost hat is way too broken. Although it does require a ton of red orbs, given the fact that you'll probably be being in the game a ton of times, it feels way too easy to exploit the boss hat, and just take a look at how much damage it does on DMD mode with just one phase of its meteor move charged up. Generally speaking, the guns feel far more satisfying to use than in previous games, because goddamn, just listen to this shit! A big problem that I've had with previous Devil May Cry games is that the guns didn't really feel that impactful when you used them. Really they felt more like pea shooters and, well, they kind of were pea shooters in gameplay, but it all depends on how the gun feels. If the gun doesn't feel satisfying to use, you're not going to use it that often. That's kind of the same problem that the DMC reboot especially fell into. In this game, the sound effects for the guns feel beautiful. You really do feel like you're putting bullets through enemy skulls and really laying the smack down them with your pistols. I really felt like I wanted to use guns way more than I ever did in previous games. Now that we've got our blaster babes out of the way, let's get down to our masterful, magnificent, mutilating melee weapons. Dante, of course, has got his classic rebellion along, along with the Devil Sword Sparta, but it is a bit disappointing that Sparta is basically a reskin rebellion that does more damage. Now. Dante's new tools are where things get interesting. The new punch and kick gauntlet, Balrog, is my favorite out of the fisticuff weapons. Gilgamesh in DMC4 only was valuable because of the air dive and its distorted real impacts. Distortion attacks have been taken out, which is a good thing in my opinion because DT Distort has never really taken that much skill and with how overpowered it is, how much damage it does, it pretty much ruined any chance of experimentation with Gilgamesh. So the fact is that DG Distort being taken out really does encourage players to experiment more with Balrog's moves, which to be fairly honest, is a much smarter way to really balance the game. 
Especially with the Frost Hat in the game. Balrog has two modes for the player to experiment with. A boxing stance that allows Dante to power up Balrog and to potentially stun enemies with it, and a kick stance that focuses on sick looking kicks that can lay the smack down on the demon dickheads. Going into the real fresh blood of Dante's melee weapons lies Cavalier, a cool as hell fucking motorcycle that Dante can turn into dual chainsaws. How's that for Road Rash? Not the kind of weapon you'd see every day, that's for sure. This is easily one of my favorite additions to Dante's arsenal, and with it, you can switch between the motorbike and the chainsaw modes to chew the enemies to bits with. It's honestly quite amazing that Tsunoda and his team managed to integrate a single action scene from DMC3 into actual gameplay! We've also got some returning devil arms as well! Cerberus makes a comeback into DMC5, with Dante once again regaining the ability to give the body some cold reception. <laughs> this time around, Cerberus has got some new features to up the variety. Cerberus gets an electric three chain staff, along with a fire bow staff, and using these modes, it's just sick as hell to pull off. I mean, goddamn, look at how badass this shit gets with your combos. You essentially got three weapons in one! Also, we finally have Taunts back. After idiotically being left out of the reboot, by the way, it's kind of funny the only bad Devil May Cry games are the ones that didn't have Taunts. Taunts are finally back in a big way, specifically the addition of Aerial Taunts. These new taunts give different effects for each character. Nero's air taunt gives him a sort of aerial dodge which allows him to get some more air time and pretty much stay out of harm's way. Dante's air taunt allows him to use Lucifer's rose from DMC4 to finish off enemies or use it to juggle them. Something that clearly shows that Itsuno has been watching Junguri for a while. These air taunts basically function the same way as Nero's but far less cool in my opinion to be honest. But man, my god, I fucking love taunts. Taunts give so much more personality to the character you're playing as and a chance to look sick as hell while doing it. And really, there's nothing more fun than making fun of a giant demon boss that thinks itself to be hot shit. Come on. It's All of these taunts really do help add character to each one, and helps prevent DMC5 from getting way too dark sometimes. Because there's nothing more fun than just being able to find some humor in the heat of a moment, even though there's a giant demon boss that's probably gonna try to crush you in a few seconds if you don't get out of the way, and then just dodging at the last second while you're making fun of the enemy. It really does help that you feel truly invincible, even though you're definitely not, and that you pretty much have these powers, and that nothing can stop you in the grand scheme of things. With all these new weapons, what about the styles for Dante? Well, you've got your good old Swordmaster, Gunslinger, Trickster, and Royal Guard, but well, it is a bit disappointing that you don't unlock any new styles to use, especially since Nero has a Quicksilver-esque weapon to use. I mean, you can already imagine it. How cool would it be if you could stop time, then use Doppelganger to split into two beings, then use Swordmaster to knock enemies up into the air, then use Gunslinger, and then switch to a Shotgun Blast, and then Devil Trigger, and then Stinger right through- Okay, but getting back to the normal styles, Gunslinger is the style that seems to have the most changes to it, with being able to fire Ebony and Ivory on their own, the ability to use a Shotgun combo, and the passive buff that charges most of your guns. Royal Guard has also gone through a few changes, notably Normal Guards. Performing Normal Guards now drains DT instead of health. This feels like a good way to encourage more players to use Royal Guard while still requiring skill to use, 
since performing Royal Blast can power up the Royal Meter much faster and gain DT in order to... Well, we'll get to that in the spoilers territory. Performing a counter attack with Royal Release has a satisfying punch to it with its sound effects making you feel like you just shot a hole through reality itself. I mean, holy fuck! Each of these styles gives you unique ways to play and look like the ultimate demon slaying badass to the point where you can go into a fight going around wielding your guns like in some 90s action flick to the point where you can waltz into a fight barely interested and block it like no fucks given. Hell, there's even a skill where you can literally unequip every single weapon in the game and just use Royal Guard to win. I mean, you got have some serious demon balls to pull a move like that on. Now that we got our playable cast out of the way, Let's delve into the newest addition to the Devil May Cry series, Co-op. Yeah, that's right. They're going full throttle with balls to the wall action to the point where you can team up with other players. At certain points throughout the main campaign, Dante, Nero, and V's past will converge and allow them to team up with each other. Unfortunately, for some reason, this mechanic is only used twice throughout the game. And in fact, it's also pretty shocking that it doesn't even appear in the Blight Palace mode. You expect Capcom to put it into an update, but alas, Here's to hoping we get to see some more co-op in the future. DMC5 also brings in an amazing roster of bosses that each serve to test your own abilities. Goliath, for example, is one of the best bosses in the game due to the sheer number of ways to play around with his boss, such as bustering him when he tries to charge right at you, using Gerbera to reflect his fireballs right at him, Cavalier Angelo also stands out as a boss fight for Dante, given the fact that it forces players to start partying his swords and basically giving him one hell of an ass whooping after wheeling down his defenses. Dante's bosses in particular stand out as some of the best in the game, and that's saying something given that Nero's boss fights are pretty damn good all on their own. But seriously, am I the only one that's hoping for Capcom to make a DLC having all the playable Capcom heroes and villains from other franchises be playable? I need a Wesker boss fight. No, a Ryu boss fight. No, an Akuma boss fight. No, a Morgan boss fight. Or maybe, if Platinum Games is willing, a Bayonetta boss fight, eh? Anyone want a Bayonetta Dante crossover? Come on, I can't be the only one. <sighs> Last one's probably wishful thinking though. Either way, the bosses in Devil May Cry 5 stand out as some of the best the series has ever had to offer in a long while. And that's surprising given how good the bosses in DMC3 were, aside from Doppelganger. Notably, none of the bosses in DMC5 are actually reused, except for a boss rush with V where three of the bosses you've dealt with throughout the entire game. In this boss rush, the bosses in this boss rush are Goliath, Artemis, and Cavalier Angelo. Except the problem is, you're playing with V, and to be fairly honest, V really stands out because he simply is not a fun character to use in boss fights due to his, well, quite repetitive nature and the fact that you basically have to play keep away. But the biggest problem with this boss gauntlet is the fact that it starts off by taking away your abilities. So essentially, so essentially, V's repetitive combat becomes even more repetitive given the fact that you lose even more tools. And let's be honest, if Griffin pretty much is the best one to start off with given his high damaging charge attack, but honestly, is it really fun to stand around, jumping around like an aimless idiot, hoping that Griffin can charge up his attacks just enough for you to basically chip damage away? I don't think so, to be honest. If they were going to do a boss rush in this game, it would have been so much better to do it with a better character, such as Dante, for example. Even though I don't like the idea of repeating boss fights, if there is a character that should have these bosses repeated against, it is Dante, given how funny he is to play as. Enemy designs have also been improved drastically with new enemies to deal with and old enemies to deal with, such as the mask wielding nobodies and scissor 
ghost creatures from DMC1, the hell soldiers from DMC3, and even some sword wielding demons from DMC4 which are more focused around pirating their attacks. There's not a single enemy in the game that really requires you to adopt a forced set of tactics. And there's no enemy that's particularly annoying like the Blitz. Now, the Fury I think in particular stands out as a difficult enemy that's done right. See, the Blitz I felt that in DMC4, it was pretty much unfair because it pretty much removed one of your ways of fighting. Essentially, you lose more ways to fight and basically I have to resort to just hoping that you'll just have enough damage to pull out so you can basically resort to knocking them down in one hit. Dealing with Blitzes in DMC4 basically required you to use the DT Distort exploit for Dante and just rely on charge shots with Nero and hoping for the best. In DMC5, the Fury serves as a similar type of enemy to the Blitz. However, it requires better learning of the mechanics, such as particularly pirating. You need to learn how to time your attacks against the Fury's attacks. And pirating these enemies is oh so satisfying to pull it off with. Where you're just hammering opponents away like no tomorrow without putting any effort into it. You do have to learn how to play with these mechanics, otherwise you're going to be getting your ass knocked down quite a lot. Now the story for DMC5 is easily up there with DMC3 with all of our favorite characters being pushed to their limits in this game. Unlike DMC4, the stakes are high since the big baddie and all this basically stomps Dante's shit at the beginning of the game, leaving Nero and V to have to pick up the slack. The whole campaign is pretty well paced and aside from a fight with Gilgamesh that's just as mediocre as the weapon itself. I never really felt that the game lost my interest as the plot went on. Now let's get into the spoiler territory. Starting right off with the prologue, the story starts out with Nero arriving to assist Dante in a battle against the new demon king, Urizin, and after a short fight, Nero was forced to retreat with V while Dante is quickly defeated. By the way, I gotta respect Itsuno for allowing you to beat Urizen in the prologue and to get a special ending. I mean, you've gotta be one hell of a cheeky guy to literally make it possible to beat the game early. Hell, you can do this and actually unlock more difficulty modes before beating the entire game! That's the kind of meta humor that more video games need to start having. After Nero and V retreat, a month later they return to the city with Nico, a mechanic who builds Nero's Devil Breakers in tow. The first few levels seem to build up with Nero as the last hope of stopping Uruzin, but then on mission 10, we finally, after 11 years of waiting, get to play as Dante once more. Right, sunshine, now put a fire under it. We gotta get going because that annoying pimple Nero is making a beeline for Uruzin, and if he gets there, he's gonna fall off. After you start playing as Dante, the story's focus firmly shifts to him for a good while, and the ways in which the story adds to his character is done brilliantly. Dante's personality in this game feels like a fusion of DMC1 and DMC4 Dante, with the character in the fifth entry being a fun-loving wisecracker who does know when to take things seriously. It keeps the character a joy to watch while not sacrificing much of the tension the game's main antagonist provides. Even then, Dante isn't shilled throughout the story by making the story all about him, and Nero doesn't become a Gary Stu, unlike a certain other character that brings back a classic franchise. The story does have its fair share of fan service, but unlike other sequels, it's done in a polished and well thought out way. Many callbacks to previous Devil May Cry games are made, and even certain other forms of media, such as the anime, in fact. Devil May Cry. Dante! But none of it really gets to the point where it becomes obnoxious to the point where a certain other franchise takes it. And while the story does repeat certain plot lines, it doesn't really do it to the point where the story feels like a carbon cutout of a previous story. Now, going back to the plot, after delivering an ass kicking to a bunch of demons, 
Dante makes his way to Uruzin until he comes across a site many fans, including myself, never thought we'd get to see in a Devil May Cry game. Yes, we do in fact visit the home of Dante and Virgil. After many years of only getting a few hints or references to Dante and Virgil's past, this game finally gives us concrete details of Dante and Virgil's mother and the circumstances of her death in one of the most brilliantly executed scenes in any action game. You need to hide, Dante. No matter what happens, you mustn't leave. The fact that we don't see how Eva died makes her death all the more tragic and horrifying and shows how it played into Dante's mindset in the first Devil May Cry game. I do wish that we did get to explore more Dante and Virgil's wrecked home a bit more since, since we could have gotten more details of what their life was like before, before their mother's death. Back in the present, Dante looks at the Shad Rebellion and continues a long running tradition in all the Devil May Cry games. Kill yourself later! I'll help! If Dimato can separate man from devil, then what about the rebellion? Dante then fuses the rebellion with the devil sword Sparta and finally brings out his ultimate form. Sin Devil Trigger. What follows is an excellent fight against Uruzin, where you utilize Dante's newest form and to proceed to lay a can of whoop ass on the demon who just hours ago was kicking your ass back to square one. Relating to Sin DT, I think it's time for us to get into a little history lesson with Professor Killer Crit. Back when DMC2, the worst game in the series, yes, even worse than the reboot, was released. A special DT form for Dante was given to him called Majin Form. Granting Dante invincibility, high attack power, and laser attacks, it made an already pathetically easy game even easier than before. Going back to DMC5, Sin DT is basically the concept of Majin Form, realized to its fullest potential to where it actually reuses a few attacks. However, Sin DT works so much better in many different ways since you can activate the transformation without being at low health which gives you more options to use. For starters, you aren't invincible, so you still need to watch yourself and you can't heal in this form either. Second, it requires you to drain your normal DT into Sin DT bars, so in order to really get a good hand in this form, you need to learn Royal Guard and perfect your timing so you can actually perform perfect blocks since they give you DT. Third, using the meter up leaves you wide open so it adds another element of strategy to the game. Fourth. A move called Quadriple S allows Dante to sin DT for a few seconds without draining the meter as long as he quickly turns back into the form. The twist is that you need to have an SSS rank in order to use the move, requiring players to pull off the highest ranks they can get in combat to fully bring out the true potential of Dante's arsenal of abilities. Even then you can't just use sin DT's big moves such as the ability to create a vortex or start raining missiles down your opponent or let's just say. Dante's take on Virgil's Judgment Cut's end. It's honestly amazing to me that Tsuno managed to bring back a mechanic that was at one point reviled by everyone and to make it one of the coolest additions to the Devil May Cry series. A few missions later we get a rematch with Cerberus and the entire boss fight Feels like what a fight against Cerberus from DMC3 would feel like if it had more budget and if it was fully realized to its fullest potential. And that's what DMC5 is when it comes down to it. DMC4 but with the excellent weapons and character death of DMC3 with a bigger budget than ever before. What follows after this fight is where the game really heats up in a story. Dante manages to catch up with Uruzin and at this point the big twist is finally revealed. Uruzin and V are Virgil's demon half and human half separated into two different beings. It's revealed that Virgil survived the events of Devil May Cry 1, where he was basically possessed by the main villain of the game, Mundus, and turned into his slave. After Dante defeated him, Virgil survives the events of the game, but his torture from Mundus left him decaying with his life hanging by a thread. Virgil, in an act of desperation years later, 
uses the Yamato to remove the human half of his demon half to regenerate from his injury. Every chain that does freeze my body. In order to defeat his younger brother, he could only do one thing with the crumbling flesh and feelings. He needed to separate man from devil with the strength of the Yamato. However, this quickly backfires with Virgil's demon half going crazy, becoming Uruzen. Suddenly, Uruzen's generic quotes and motivations about being absolute power make more sense in hindsight. Because without Virgil's humanity, he would lose his reason for why he wants to become stronger, and as such, this path is where it could ultimately lead him towards. A thing to keep in mind is that they do their best to differentiate Uruzen and V from Virgil in order to show the different sides of Virgil and what contextualizes his abilities. V embodies the sleek style and demeanor of Virgil while it's lacking his raw power, hence why he relies on his demon pets. Uruzen embodies Virgil's sheer power but lacks the style and finesse of his whole counterpart, best shown in his fight with Dante after the reveal. Once Dante catches up to Uruzen, the latter eats the demon fruit and thus the final battle between Dante and Uruzen begins. And let me just start off by saying the entire setting of this battle is just brilliant. The fight starts off with an illusion of Dante and Virgil's home, but as Uruzen begins to lose the fight, the entire illusion begins to crack until by the end of the fight, it's almost completely turned into a nightmarish hellscape. What's wrong, Virgil? No time. It really helps give off the feeling that this might just be the end of the series at this point, and it would end right where it all began. Of course, it doesn't end right here, but it is a thematically perfect fitting place for Dante and Urigen's final duel. Not about loss. Strength is a choice. Fighting like hell to protect what's important. Threw away everything you ever had. No wonder you have no choice. After Dante defeats Uruzin, V appears and manages to fuse with Uruzin, and after 14 years of waiting, Virgil finally returns. What is this? Virgil. It could have been so easy to completely screw this whole return up by making Virgil's return have no impact on the plot itself and just have him appear and be good once more or have Virgil just become an outright villain once again and just try to kill everyone right then and there rather than simply building up to his role as the final antagonist that Dante and Nero had to come across to finish but instead of doing that the game has many plot points that were shown in DMC4 that were never really resolved in that game finally being addressed here such as Nero being Virgil's son uh, let me guess, I'm dead weight? Well, you can That's show not them. it, Nero. What is it then? He's your father! It should also be mentioned here that, to be honest, this entire scene really does show just how far the Devil May Cry acting has gone. Back in the day, in the first Devil May Cry game, the entire dialogue was very cheesy and, and very, very cringeworthy many times in a row. I should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light! light, light, light. Now today, the acting has gone so well that genuine heartfelt moments can really become really effective with the game's story. The entire reveal with Nero being Virgil's son is easily one of the best scenes in the entire game because of just how well acted it is. Now he needs an ass kicking, but I can't have you go kill your old man. My father. Virgil's return doesn't stop there. It brings major changes to the entire cast. With Dante deciding that he needs to put down Virgil in order to spare Nero the pain of killing his own father, with Nero being shocked by what's happening since, well, he just found out that the guy who chopped off his own arm at the beginning of the game turns out to be his own father. Dante then proceeds to go up the giant demon tower that's finally rising up into the atmosphere to confront his brother, but not before we get an awesome callback to DMC1 where you fight all the previous bosses from that game. After Dante conquers his old foes, 
They get sent off from Dante with, of course, his own funny ways of doing so. Godspeed, Dante. You'll need it. Rest in peace, little chicken. It's been a bash. After this fun nostalgia trip, Dante finally meets his brother Virgil, and after all these years, we get another spectacular duel between the two. Give me the motto. If you want it, then you'll have to take it. But you already knew that. I had a feeling you'd say that. Two older legends finally, after all these years of waiting, battling each other on top of a giant demon planet that's heading into space and threatening to crush the Earth and utilizing all the moves they learned over the years. With Dante using his DMC3 weapons and style switching a DMC4, and Virgil using his classic rapid slash and judgment cuts, and along with judgment cuts and from DMC4 Special Edition. Hell, they even bring in some of Virgil's moves from the reboot, such as the doppelganger move. There's so many ways to play this entire fight. Do you use Trickster to keep out Virgil's reach? Use Royal Guard to block Virgil's judgment cuts and show how big your dick is by Royal releasing when Virgil tries to bum rush you when he's flying? Yes, flying! Do you also use Royal Guard to power up Sin DT to maximize your damage output? Come on. Or just mock his ass until he gets pissed at you and goes ape shit on your ass. Man. I'm bored. Come on, baby. Come get The entire boss fight can be compared to Metal Gear Solid 4's final boss, for just how much of a nostalgia trip it is. It's how many ways you can exploit the mechanics and easily manage to be one of the most epic final bosses in gaming history. Almost on par with DMC3's final boss fight. Now, here's where you could have ended the game, right here with Dante striking Virgil down once more, or perhaps, more fittingly, striking each other down. And fans probably would have accepted it. But instead of it soon going with the more obvious kind of ending, he subverts expectations the right way. And it's right before Dante and Virgil can continue fighting, a new challenger approaches. Coming back to a few minutes, we see Nero making his way up the tower until he hilariously comes across a new payphone that still works, you know we're on a giant demon parasite heading into space and Nero gets a cheesy if heartwarming message from a character who we're gonna remember the name of for a good long time. And now all of a sudden I find out I have a family. What am I supposed to do with that? You always know which path is right and which is wrong. Right after that, we get a scene that fans have been waiting for for a long time. Nero pulling his devil trigger. I'm not letting you die! And it's the moment that Nero truly comes into his own as a hero. His desire to save the only family he has left awakens his true power, and here is where the story reaches its peak. Whereas DMC3 shows the ruination of family, DMC5 is about the recolonization of family. Nero then jumps into the fray and makes a promise to stop his father and his uncle from killing each other. You listen, dead weight. I won't let you kill each other. There are other ways of settling your differences. I'm putting a stop to this sibling rivalry. Virgil, of course, refuses to back down, and thus, Nero vs. Virgil begins. Father vs. Son. After 11 years of waiting, these two legendary warriors finally meet, and the whole fight between them is just brilliant. The whole thing shows just how far the two have come, with Nero doing everything he can to save his family, 
and Virgil having a more positive attitude, hinting at more heroic demeanor, to the point where he starts making dad jokes of all things. It's past your bedtime. The point where Nero finally uses his Devil Trigger for the first time in gameplay is just freaking awesome. Fuck you. Earth to the reboot, this is how you do a fuck you to the final boss. This is how you do it. From that point on, it gets so much more epic, with Nero impaling his own father, suplexing him, or even deciding to put some heads together for once. After a long, grueling fight, Nero finally manages to get his father to listen to reason and to work with Dante to close the demon portal. Wait, where are you going? We need to sever the Clyphod roots from the underworld itself. Then we'll seal the portal with the Yamato. Dante then passes on the role of the human world's protector to Nero, and the sons of Sparta part ways for the time being. The game then ends with Nero embracing his new role as Earth's protector. So, devils cry, huh? Let's hear what that sounds like! While Dante and Virgil reconcile and become friendly rivals with the game going out of the line, that any Devil May Cry fan would be familiar with. Don't you dare say it, Jackpot! Devil May Cry 5 is easily one of the best action games. No, it is simply the best action game I've ever played in my life. It's a game that really celebrates everything as Devil May Cry 5 while doing its best to end the series in style. The characters who absolutely need focus are focused on correctly right here, and Virgil's return in this game isn't really done haphazardly, it isn't just some stupid, oh, he's back then, so now the fans will be pleased like a certain other video game. DMC 5's mechanics are just so incredible. Nero is absolutely fun to play with, along with V, and Dante is just so fucking awesome to play with. He has so many mechanics to exploit the system with, and you have so many ways to play the game, that it becomes one of the most incredible action experiences you're ever going to have in a long while. The story is absolutely incredible and truly brings the entire series together where it leaves the story open for a continuation while still ending the saga at the very least in style unlike a certain other video game that was more concerned with setting up sequels rather than finishing its saga off. DMC5 easily becomes a 10 out of 10. It's one of the most incredible games you will ever play in your life and you absolutely must pick this up if you're a Devil May Cry fan and if you're an action game fan. It is absolutely worth your money, and I hope to God that we get to see DLC in the future with a certain spoiler character and Trish and Lady finally being playable in the game. It would be so much fun to have these characters be playable one more time before we had to wait for a Devil May Cry 6, and I simply really do hope that at some point we get to see some more playable characters and perhaps even some Lighthouse Cop, and I gotta say, DMC 5 is Devil May Cry done. Perfectly. Because I think it's safe to say, Devil May Cry is back. Right before we go, just to keep it with a motto, Devils Never Cry.